we can um, have some semblance of normality in this otherwise difficult time is to vaccinate or inoculate everyone with a vaccine for COVID-19. And uh, but this depends very much on the availability and supply of vaccines. And the availability and supply of vaccines will very much depend on the amount of RNT that has actually gone towards developing this vaccine, because as you know, this is a new disease. It's known as the new coronavirus. And although coronaviruses have been in existence for a very long period of time, this one is a new one. So we need to have a vaccine for this uh, new one. So it's basically we are talking about uh, innovation, uh, because in innovation theory, we have a hierarchy of novelty. And here we are talking about something which is new to the world and not just new to the firm or to the country. OK, so uh, those countries which have managed to have a strong r and in uh, vaccines and also its manufacturing are the ones which have been able to restart their economies in some way or other. And uh, uh, and and so uh, the uh, your ability to um, uh, move forward very much depend on vaccine technology. And given the fact that uh, vaccines is like a new knowledge production is characterized by market failures, and I'll explain this concept a little bit more further, um, um, uh, it will call for some intervention by the state. OK, so you cannot visualize a situation of uh, knowledge production uh, happening without the explicit role of the state. I must emphasize the point that when I when I mean explicit role of the state, it's not state itself doing things, but state can actually support the activities of the market through a variety of channel means and instruments. And that's precisely what I'm actually talking about. Now you can see that uh, uh, the way in which I'm going to present my uh, paper is first I will briefly survey the what I may call the renewed debate on the role, role of industrial policies. And in my paper, I do, do not make any distinction between industrial policy and innovation policy instruments because they are essentially the uh, same and uh, it, it, it in only in terms of its content and and so on it uh, um, it, it, it differs. OK, so the term innovation and industrial policies are used almost like synonyms uh, in my in my frame of reference. OK, now I must say that there has been a move towards moving away from industrial policy across the world. And uh, and and you can see that very large developing countries such as India, such as Brazil uh, and and even in the case of uh, China, which uh, uh, started to embracing market socialism since uh, 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 late 1970s, began to reduce the importance of role, role uh, importance of the role of government in their uh, with respect to economic matters, and, and and this was done through a policy of uh, uh, you know liberalizing the industrial sector or economic liberalization in general, and through also privatization. Uh, uh, for instance, in India, a large number of public sector enterprises were privatized through the divestiture road. Okay, so this was happening uh, from uh, uh, from around the 1990s, and then came the global financial crisis of 2008. Of course, we had the Asian financial crisis in 1997, which again uh, raised some role for government, at least in those countries those countries and any, anyway the most of the asian financial crisis affected countries were the ones in which government was playing a very important role in the past okay now in 2008-9 when we had the global financial crisis people began to again invoke the role of government because you can see that uh, uh, unless the government was participating uh, there, were, there was large scale bankruptcies and so on in, in various parts of the world okay so, uh, so you have a renewed debate on the industrial policy, and I will briefly look at that uh, uh, debate. And before that, I must also say that uh, even before uh, the uh, the uh, renewed debate on industrial policy, there was actually a renewed debate on the role of government with respect to knowledge production. And this debate actually started in 19, the early, late 1950s and 19. Uh, early 1960s, okay, and this debate uh, surprisingly started in the United States, and it remained by and large there, uh, and with some offshoots in the Western Western Europe and so on. 
Thereafter, I will go into the research questions which I am specifically asking in this paper. The, it's the significance of this research questions and the rationale for choosing two countries which are at two different levels of development, United States and India. And, and I will give you some specific reasons or rationale for choosing the two cases. Then after that, I will spend a lot of time looking at the way in which the United States government, which is supposed to be a free market economy, have gone around using every single industrial policy instrument that one is talking about or one is available uh, for, for that's available on the book. Okay. And they have even, as I was mentioning in some private conversation before, uh, resurrected some of the old industrial policy instruments which they had put in place just for during the Korean War period in the 1950s. Okay, and use that quite effectively to jumpstart vaccine research and its manufacturing. And you can see the uh, the the outcomes are for for everyone to see. Okay, then I will talk about the Indian case because India is a country which has actually been using industrial policy in some measure until the 1990s and thereafter it has liberalized and uh, and and during the vaccine uh, uh, the, the pandemic period the government seems to have taken a kind of a back seat and uh, until at last when the supreme court stepped in and asked the government to do various kinds of uh, measures so i will talk about the indian case of after i discuss the us case then I will contrast the two cases in terms of uh, the number of instrument, the number and nature of instruments which they have used, and the kind of uh, uh, policy outcomes that we can talk about. Of course, talking about policy outcome of a phenomena which is still evolving is actually a problem. And then I will conclude with some policy less clear policy lessons for India. So let me start with a, a brief survey of uh, uh, um, the de renewed debate on industrial policy. And as I mentioned before, um, um, I, it started around 2009 with the publication of a very important book by Chimoli, um, uh, Dossi and Stiglitz. And this book has actually for the first time uh, uh, talked about industrial policies, including those affecting accumulation of technological knowledge, institutions supporting scientific and technological learning, competition and intellectual property rights and trade policies, all of which are relevant now and which I will be uh, talking about or uh, discussing in the context of both India and, uh, and the United States. And in fact, in that book, there was actually an interesting paper by uh, Professor Ajit Singh uh, from Cambridge University on the Indian case, uh, where how India has actually moved away from using industrial policy uh, and uh, um, and or, or almost like abandoning industrial policy in a certain uh, measure during that period. Thereafter, you have this paper by Stiglitz, Lin, and Mon Monka, uh, and, uh, and different versions of that paper uh, at different points in time. And so there, uh, and this has actually led to this renewed debate on industrial policy. And I can see that it has gathered momentum, and uh, many countries have now replaced. Uh, uh, you know, those industrial policy instruments. And in fact, the latest is the United States going for a formal industrial policy and the Senate has already passed the uh, United States Competition and Innov Innovation and Competition Act of 2021. And it's before the Congress uh, for um, uh, to be to make it into a proper act. OK, so you can see that uh, there has been this uh, po policy. And as I said before, before uh, this renewed debate, you had this very interesting paper by uh, Arrow in 1962, which has been cited more than uh, uh, 15,000 times. Okay, and, and this Arrow has uh, brought a very important issue, which basically say that if you are le leaving knowledge production entirely in the hands of the private sector, there will be a, it's certain to have an underinvestment. Okay. Because the private sector entities are not able to appropriate the full returns of their own research, because whatever way in which you create new knowledge, it leaks out to competitors. And so the monopoly rents that you could have uh, enjoyed is now going to be ferreted out by your competitors. Of course, you have various kinds of instruments which have been in, put in place, like, for instance, the patent system, etc. But despite that, you can see that majority of the industrial innovations leak out within three years of its introduction. This is according to a study done by a Professor Edwin Mansfield of the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, 
So because of the appropriability problem, which can be explained uh, in various ways, uh, uh, you know, you can talk in terms of a societal rate of return for any innovation and a private rate of return, which is actually uh, to the uh, in the company which develops the new innovation. So it gets a, a, a monopoly return out of that. And as a result of the technology leaking out to competitors, the price of the product actually comes down. Say, for instance, you have a new drug and then, of course, you have a, a, a generic version of the new drug coming in. So the uh, the private rate of return is much below the societal rate of return. The society benefits as a result of the introduction of the new uh, the the generic version of the new drug, and as a result, uh, the overall uh, uh, price goes down. And so the uh, societal rate of return is much higher than the private rate of return. So you have a spillover gap, and larger the spillover gap, higher is the desire for firms to underinvest. So Arrow suggested that, given the fact that. Uh, uh, firms which are operating in free market economies have a possibility of under investing in R and D, and R and D being assumed as the main conduit through which new innovations are actually brought to the market. Uh, and uh, uh, there can be a, a suboptimal level of investments in R and D. And to prevent that, governments must step in and they must support uh, uh, private sector R&D through a variety of means. And one way in which you could do is to provide some kind of a subsidy, either in the form of a research grant or in the form of a tax incentive or in the form of uh, a public technology procurement, whereby government will buy all the output of that new uh, uh, risky technology that the private firm has actually developed uh, so that this appropriability problem is reduced to a minimum. Before that, in 1959, Professor Richard Nelson of Columbia University had already written a very influential paper where he has said that when you talk about uh, research, you have to make a distinction between basic research and applied development research. Basic research is basically the invention of those new, uh, new principles, which will find an expression in the form of an applied development research several years from now. Okay. So basic research being very capital intensive, very long gestation period and high failure rates, uh, there, there will be a market failure again in basic research. So that will have to be done, performed by government, not supported, but performed by government. So the two are talking about complementary items. Nelson is talking about uh, the government itself doing basic research. Arrow is talking about uh, the applied development part of the research, which being done by private sector, but supported by the government. And you have also this recent very interesting book, uh, The Entrepreneurial State, which is uh, published, uh, which is written by Professor Marina Mazzucato of uh, University College London now. And, and, and where she has actually reminded us that if you look at a wide variety of technologies, which we now take it for granted, for instance, the internet, uh, a, a microwave oven, all these have actually come from government research. So the strong role of government in knowledge production is very well understood even in supposedly free market economies, and you cannot think in terms of knowledge production without the government. Now, if you apply the same principles to vaccine development, because vaccine is a new uh, product, as I said, it's something new to the market, okay? So the government can actually intervene in a variety of ways. It can act as the lead customer because the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is actually the main uh, customer for these vaccines. So you can have public technology procurement. All the vaccines which are made will be bought by the government. So the, the companies can you not know, worry about the costs which, the, in, which they have incurred in developing those and so on. Second, the government can actually reduce the risk of innovation by co-funding it. They can give a variety of uh, uh, grants, uh, tax incentive, advanced market commitments. Advanced market commitment is an instrument which is very, very essential in the context of vaccines because this is a very risky technology. It undergoes, it can only be, uh, even after the uh, new technology has been developed, it has to undergo three phases of trials. And these trials are uh, very time consuming and you can have a big failure during this uh, trials. And, and, and so companies will not be interested in taking up the man, uh, you know, development of this technology because it's only after the trials that you can actually, uh, uh, the phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, as you, I'm sure you would have read about that in the newspapers, et cetera, and so on. So advanced marketing commitment is one place where government will upfront by the 
doses of vaccines even before it has been tried uh, uh, undergone the trials okay so uh, and that is uh, uh, sanctioned by the who and so this is some an important instrument that has actually very relevant in the context of uh, vaccine research third is collaboration guarantee because uh, uh, vaccines uh, research is now uh, taking place through a variety of platforms and now if you take uh, covid 19 vaccines we have now 287 RT projects according to the WHO vaccine tracker. Okay, 287 RT projects which are going on in different parts of the world. And out of the 287 projects, about 103 projects have actually come to the to various uh, clinical trials. Okay, and uh, out of this 103 clinical uh, uh, projects, many of them are actually uh, uh, they, they are using almost like uh, nine or 10 different types of uh, technologies to develop these vaccines, okay? And given the fact that some of these technologies are like absolutely new, which has never been tried out before, they require a fair amount of competencies which are not available in any particular firm. So uh, firms will have to join and partner with each other to develop, uh, to co-develop the vaccine. So join r and programs, uh, 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 either with the government or uh, government research institutes, or with, uh, uh, for instance, co-vaccine, which has been developed in India by Bharat Biotech, was jointly developed with, uh, uh, the, uh, with the National Institute of Virology and the Indian Medi uh, Council of Medical Research. Okay, so that's basically the collaboration that I'm talking about. Then, of course, you can use standards and regulations also to help vaccine manufacturers. For instance, patent policy, we have had a big discussion on patent waivers in the context of uh, 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 and, and patent pledges, all of which I will go in, uh, into detail in my, in my presentation as I progress with it. Okay, And also during regulatory policies, for instance, there are two different routes to arrive at uh, the uh, uh, vaccine which can be sold in the market. One is the uh, uh, the route where you have the uh, initial r and the concept is developed, and then you have the phase one trial, then uh, the, the data is analyzed, and then you are allowed to do the uh, phase two trial in, uh, in a sequential fashion, and then the phase three, and then uh, the vaccine is actually sold in the market. So that's a normal route, okay? But that route, that regulation can be now you know, uh, short-circuited by having what is called the uh, emergency user authorization route, where all these trials will take place in an overlapping manner. And at the same time, while the trial is going on, you also start uh, manufacturing the vaccine, uh, vaccine at risk. Okay, so the, uh, the Production Serum Institute was already started manufacturing Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine while the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was undergoing its uh, three trials. Okay. And or uh, uh, because otherwise you will not be able to manufacture because you are talking about billions of doses of vaccine. We are not talking about a small quantity that you can manufacture. So this will take time. Okay, and and uh, and, and the fact that as I uh, said, uh, the the faster you do it, the, uh, the 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 faster you can come to terms with this uh, uh, particular uh, pandemic. Now, what are the major research questions that I'm asking? The first research question that I'm asking is that. Why is, how is that the United States have managed to develop vaccines in such a short period of time? Because they have taken only about 10 months to develop a complex piece of uh, uh, you know, technology. Because vaccine technology is much more complex than therapeutics. And, and, and so uh, it takes a number of years. For instance, if you look at the history of uh, 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 vaccine uh, R&D in the world, uh, you you can see that uh, the typhoid fever for typhoid it has taken almost like hundreds of years. Uh, you know the 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 pathogen which was linked to the disease was found out in 1880. Okay, and the vaccine was uh, licensed to be used in the U.S. Uh, for instance in year uh, uh, 2000 or uh, or late uh, 1990s. So many years it has taken. At the other end you have measles where the pathogen was developed uh, was found out in. Uh, 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 sometime in 1950s, and the vaccine was licensed in, in, in uh, the 1960s, so about 10 years. And on the on the right hand side, I've given the timeline for COVID-19 vaccines, which is just 10 months. So how is that normally when vaccines take so many years to develop, the Americans have managed to develop these vaccines in such a short period of time. Uh, did they have some kind of a magic? And, and what is that magic? 
That's the question that I'm trying to answer. Uh, that's the first question that I'm trying to answer. Okay. Have they, uh, what is that they have done? What kind of instruments which they have done, uh, used, invoked uh, to jumpstart vaccine manufacturing in such a short period of time? Uh, uh, and as I said, this is a absolutely new invention, which is new to the world, you know, uh, you know and never existed before at all. Okay. The second question that I'm dealing with is basically India's role in vaccine r and manufacturing, because India is among the developing countries, a country which had a long history of uh, uh, developing technological capability. We have uh, the, our technology capability in vaccine manufacturing in general runs into hundreds, uh, almost like 100 years, you know, and uh, and uh, and many of our research laboratories uh, uh, were established uh, in the late 19th century. OK, and even our private sector companies, which are uh, manufacturing vaccines, were set up in the 1950s and 60s and, 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 and so on. So India has a long history of vaccine research and manufacturing, but why is that? We are, and we are also considered to be a very low cost manufacturer of vaccines, which is very important in the case of COVID-19 because you require billions of doses. So the whole world was actually looking upon to India as a, 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 a you know, a, a, a factory producing vaccines for the entire developing world. But we don't seem to have, um, you know, uh, fulfilled that requirement at all. So how is that we have not fulfilled that requirement? So uh, and so these are the two major research questions that I'm asking. As I, uh, and and uh, the significance of this, I've already explained large scale vaccination is the only uh, route to returning to some semblance of uh, normalcy. And other countries, especially in developing countries, are looking upon to India, for instance, this COVAX partnership, which is a partnership between WHO and uh, and a number of other countries uh, uh, to supply, uh, to buy vaccines and then supply them at very cheap rate to uh, least developed countries, depends on India for its vaccine supplies. Okay, so India. India cannot get it wrong. It has to develop these vaccines in a short period of time and make it available not only to its own, its own citizens, but also to, uh, to the developing world. Okay. And Indian vaccine firms are also looking up to the USA for vaccine technology because I will talk about three different strategies which Indian firms have used, and one of them is joint RT partnerships. And, and, and these partnerships are entirely with the US. And in fact, you can see that a lot of the vaccine development in India has actually been already taking place with the, for instance, the vaccine action program uh, in India has also been with the United States. So there is a fair amount of connection with the US, uh, sectoral system of innovation of vaccine in the US uh, uh, with that of the one in India and so on. And this analysis of these two cases then will present us with a range of convenient policy options, uh, which other countries can also use uh, to increase vaccine production, and that can lead to uh, the uh, production of vaccines, uh, you know, increasing in the world as a whole. Now, rationale for choosing these two countries, I've already explained that USA is the first country to develop a, a very effective va uh, vaccine, and, and, and uh, both India and the United States are two prominent manufacturers of vaccines, vaccines in general and COVID-19 vaccines also. And I'll give you some numbers on the amount of vaccines that we have actually produced uh, so far. And the US has, of course, a very robust public R&D system. For instance, even when they were uh, talking about free market economy, etc., and so on, in the area of health research, and as, I, as Nelson had argued, the basic research especially was completely supported by the state in the form of the National Institutes of Health. So if you take every major uh, uh, drug that has been introduced in the United States by private sector companies, the origin of these, com uh, th these uh, for instance, the remdesivir, okay, a drug which is a repurposed old drug, which has been now used for uh, treating COVID-19, okay, which can reduce the number of days that a COVID-19 person can uh, spend in the hospital, that was initially developed by the National Institutes of Health and then, of course, uh, licensed to Gilead, which is a private sector company. Okay. And India, as you know, is a low cost manufacturer of vaccine and it has also got one of the largest, uh, 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 you know, installed capacity for making all kinds of vaccines. In fact, our installed capacity currently on an annual basis is 
8.15 billion uh, doses per annum, and we make 29 different types of vaccines across uh, public sector uh, enterprises and laboratories and private sector enterprises. In fact, 89% of this capacity is actually in uh, private sector enterprises. Now, if you look at the cumulative production of uh, vaccines, uh, of course, China is number one now, or they're uh, producing almost like 1 billion uh, doses. This is COVID-19 vaccines, by the way. And the period of uh, the time that I'm talking about is a very short period of time from November 2020 to May the, uh, uh, 2021. So we are talking about seven months uh, time. Uh, you know, uh, China has produced something like 908 million doses of vaccine. European Union about 378, United States about 369. But most of the U uh, vaccines which are produced in the United European Union are by American companies. So they are not, uh, uh, you know, European uh, companies, excepting for, uh, uh, and also the, of course, you have the BioNTech, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, but it's a joint uh, thing. And uh, so a lot of the vaccines which are made in the European Union is also by American companies. Now you can see India has uh, 279 uh, uh, million doses up to uh, May 31st, 2021. Within one or two days, the data for uh, up to June 30th will be available. Okay, and you can see that only about 14 countries in the world have, uh, uh, you know, uh, making COVID-19 vaccines at all. And you can see the big difference between the top four and and the remaining. So it's basically if you net out, it's net out the Chinese uh, Chinese from the uh, from this chart. You can see that it's basically only the basically the United States and India. European Union is basically the uh, uh, most of the vaccines produced, and even the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, uh, supported by the Americans, and I will uh, talk about that uh, later. So my hypothesis is that the, the US has actually done extremely well in terms of uh, uh, vaccine development. Uh, uh, and uh, by the way, I'm not talking about vaccinations, I'm talking about production of vaccines. Uh, and, and, and in production of vaccines, India has done, uh, the United States has extremely been done well, essentially because the quantity and quality of industrial policy instruments which they have used. And in contrast, India has used very sparingly. And I must say that when you talk about the India's 279 million vaccines, uh, uh, its indigenously developed vaccines share is very low, extremely low. It's only about 10 million out of that 279. Majority of that is actually by, uh, uh, by through a voluntary license uh, which India has taken from uh, um, AstraZeneca. Okay, the numbers can be a little bit here and there. So, so that's uh, so the much better performance of the U.S. in vaccine R and D and its manufacture could be attributed to that country using a wide variety of industrial policy instruments, which I will uh, explain. The difference in income levels cannot explain this because you have European Union and uh, the uh, uh, Japan, which have not become. Uh, uh, important manufacturers of vaccine because they have not used, uh, 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 unlike in the United States, a wide variety of industrial policy instruments. They have dusted up and started using, uh, and in individual countries have used, for instance, UK has used certain amount of industrial policy instruments, but not other countries, you know. And as a result, uh, they are nowhere in terms of developing their own technologies. And I will come to the BioNTech story again, even in the BioNTech case, which is a German company, it's American technology which is actually playing the role, and we will talk about that uh, a little later. Now, let me start with the U.S. case, and I'm going to go into details about the various uh, uh, industrial instruments which U.S. has used over a period of time. Now, as you know, the, the viral genome sequence of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus which cause, causes COVID-19, was announced by the Chinese scientists around 10th and 11th of uh, uh, of uh, January 2020, and they shared it with the WHO and other countries. Immediately, the Americans have started, uh, you know, working on the vaccines within, uh, on that day itself, on that very day itself, they have started uh, uh, working on that vaccine. And within a very short period of time, you can see that uh, the Americans have actually come out with two very effective vaccines, which is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, which was released, uh, 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 the TR means trial result uh, came in November and the emergency user authorization EUA was given on the 12th of, uh, um, 11th of December, okay? 
So in January, the genome sequence was uh, announced, and by December 12th, the vaccine was already available in billion in millions of doses. Okay, and Moderna also did exactly almost uh, similar. Uh, kind of thing, and you can see that uh, the other, uh, uh, you know, the other countries have taken a little bit more time, and so on. Of course, the Chinese were also a little bit uh, quick in do doing this. In India has come in uh, with an emergency use and authorization, although there are some questions being asked about because the phase three trials of Covaxin was not conduct completed by the time, and and uh, so that was a little controversy there. So what are the range of policy instruments? How did the Americans do this so quickly? The first, my first argument is that the, the American government has, the federal government has been supporting basic research as uh, Nelson argued in 1959 in uh, uh, R&T for vaccines for a very long period of time. So let me go a little bit uh, detail into this. And in fact, the Americans were already working on coronaviruses, please remember, Coronavirus first came around 2002, we had SARS, and then we had MERS in 2012-13. And what came out in 2019-20 is basically the new SARS or the new coronavirus. So the Americans were already working on coronavirus uh, uh, from 2002 onwards. And in fact, they were, I'm sorry, they were working on coronavirus uh, va vaccines uh, or from, uh, uh, in fact, they were working on a, a new technology for making vaccine vaccines, and, and they were working on it right from 1990. Fully supported by the federal government. Okay, now why is this mRNA vaccine very important? First, is I'm not going into the science of mRNA vaccines because that's beyond my uh, capability. Okay, I'm a bit challenged there. But uh, uh, there are three reasons I can give you. Uh, I, the first reason is they are fast. To, uh, they are very fast to design. So from the get go to begin testing, you know, the, the time lag is very, very, very short. You know, and we can see that uh, it was about ten months. Okay, so it's very fast to design. Second, they are easily scalable. From a few million doses to billions of doses, you can scale it up just like that. Okay, and in the case of coronavirus. Uh, uh, the COVID-19, these two characteristics are extremely important. Uh, you know, if you quickly design a vaccine and you scale up the production very fast and you can make the vaccines available in billions of doses uh, to the national uh, government, the Ministry of Health, in fact, the ministry, Ministries of Health so quickly. Third, which has been released, uh, which has been found out just a few days ago, is that mRNA vaccines will give you lifetime immunity. So when you take those two doses of vaccine, you are actually protected for the rest of your life. Okay, you don't need to take any more vaccinations at all. So these are very much advantages as far as uh, mRNA is concerned, and this depends on two separate technologies. One is the viral protein technology, which was actually uh, in the process of being developed by Dr. Barney Graham, who works at the National Institute of Health at the Viral Pathogenesis Laboratory. And he has been working on it from 2002, along with a colleague from the University of Texas at Austin, and uh, they were working on it. In fact, Dr. Barney Graham at one point started working on the Nipah virus, which was affecting uh, Kerala, uh, for instance, in 2008-80. And he looked at the, so he has been working on this viral protein uh, to develop a, corona, a vaccine for coronavirus right from 2002. Okay, and the moment the uh, uh, from the uh, from the narration of this case, which are beautiful two narrations, one in the National Geographic in December 2020, and another one in the uh, newspaper US Today uh, in January of 2021, you can see that uh, the moment this uh, genome sequence was announced by the Chinese. Uh, Dr. Barney, Dr. Barney Graham immediately, uh, who was actually vacationing somewhere, uh, you know, he heard it over the radio or something, and uh, he, uh, the, that moment itself, he uh, activated his team, which was working on this viral protein, and they started working on a coronavirus uh, vaccine. And in fact, the viral protein which they were designing, they were already doing that with Moderna, which is a company which uh, was closely working with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. 
uh, and which is part of the National Institutes of Health. And uh, 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 and in fact, the, the name Moderna comes from uh, modified RNA. You know, so that's why Moderna, the name, the name itself comes from the, uh, that one. The second uh, technology was basically the concept of RNA modification. This was first developed by two professors based on a federal r and uh, federal, uh, uh, federally sponsored research at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, you know, which is Professor Drew Weissman and Professor Catalin Carico. Now, Professor Catalin Carico, in the meantime, had uh, actually moved out of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and she had joined BioNTech, the German company, in 2014. So that's how the German company got up, got this technology. Okay, and, and so the moment the viral genome sequence was made uh, announced, uh, BioNTech immediately started uh, working on this mRNA vaccine, and uh, 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 and they joined up with uh, Pfizer. Because the, uh, the most important thing in vaccine development, as I mentioned before, is doing these three phase trials. And while Pfizer is extremely good in, in optimizing these three phase trials. And so BioNTech joined up with uh, uh, th this one. So that, that's how uh, the BioNTech got this uh, technology from the movement of personnel uh, uh, from uh, you know, uh, University of Pennsylvania to that particular company in, in 2014. Now, a uh, 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 want of time, I cannot go into the intellectual property rights because there is a side debate. Because what you can see is that a lot of the intellectual property right uh, uh, patents for this is actually developed by the National Institute of Health. And with some of these professors, have actually taken them and they have also patented quite a lot of this. Uh, 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 of this. So there is a little controversy there. Uh, if there is time, I can go into the details. I don't have time now to go into the thing. OK, so now there is a kind of a monopoly in mRNA vaccine technology. And as I said, mRNA is the best among the 10 different technologies which are available for making vaccine. mRNA is the best because of its uh, easy to design scalability and also lifetime immunity. OK, and and, and, uh, uh, and that's why everyone is now going for the Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna vaccines. OK, and uh, and uh, and. But uh, uh, the problem is these vaccines are now covered by a large number of patents. And, and, uh, and, and, but Moderna has actually given a patent pledge. And it has actually uh, pledged that it, is, it will not enforce its intellectual property right. Because after all, it got its technology from the public laboratory. And it co-developed it along with the public laboratory. And so it's willing to uh, uh, actually have this patent pledge. Now, I can go again into the details of uh, is that a, a marketing gimmick or is that something which is uh, uh, something very substantial? I will I can go into the when I talk about the discussion. So the first point that I wish to make uh, the instrument is that Americans were supporting basic research in vaccines even when uh, you know the, uh, for a very long period of time. So when the new coronavirus came, they just had to tweak that basic research to make it into an applied development research along with these companies. And so the first lesson that everyone must learn is that basic research in vaccine development must be performed by the state and it must be supported. And, and the state can also do that joint with the private sector companies so that its applied development part of it can be, uh, uh, in, you know, can be also made quicker because that is also a risky part. And in fact, that is what the latest uh, Act from the, the the U.S. government, which is the United States uh, uh, Innovation and Competition Act of 2020-21, is supposed to correct for. Okay. The second one is uh, the second instrument which uh, the U.S. has used is uh, legislative changes to provide emergency support for vaccine development. So the immediately the U.S. Go the uh, government passed an act and they made available about 8.3 billion dollars and out of this 8.3 billion dollars about 28% or 2.3 was set apart just for vaccine research and purchase okay so very quickly the government has actually gone now when you when we discuss the indian case we find uh, you know a total absence of such uh, 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 such measures the next instrument that the americans have used is basically an institutional support mechanism and, there, and this support mechanism consists of two separate components. One is the Operation Warp Speed, the OWS, and the second one is invocation of an old 
instrument which was put in place during the 1950s during the Korean War, which I referred to earlier, which is called the Defense Production Act. And they have invoked that Defense Production Act many times. And it happened even during that president who was troublesome. I mean, uh, president, even during President Trump's time. In fact, he used it 18 times during his time, and which President uh, uh, Biden has continued that uh, uh, even now. Now, if you take the uh, the, the Operation Bob Speed, it came up in uh, the 15th of May 2020. And what they have done is they have identified, they you know, they've identified some uh, 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 champions in terms of vaccine development. And uh, they identified about six companies and they were in three different uh, kind of vaccine platforms or technologies because they didn't want to put all their eggs into one technology because mRNA, although it's an extremely good, was also, a, as I said, it's a completely new technology. And so they had also this other kind of technologies and they selected two companies in each of these and they supported them. And how much support did they give? They gave $13 billion uh, to these companies uh, and in various ways. And uh, and of course, the, the money didn't go directly to these companies. In the $13 billion did not go to them directly, but it went in various other ways. For instance, it went in, uh, in uh, 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 R&T uh, support, et cetera, and so on. And I will talk, uh, talk about that R&T support later. And another thing is that while this Operation Bob Speed was going on, the government used its other missionary to see whether these monies are being spent wisely and carefully by the companies. And so they have a kind of a CAG type of audit. And the CAG equivalent organization there is the Government Accountability Office. So it did two auditing, one in November of 2020, another one in February of 2021. But the basic, uh, uh, the purpose of this auditing, and I'm raising this, was not to find fault and do make pernicious comments, destructive comments about what these companies were doing, but rather trying to find out and help them in various difficulties which they were facing. For instance, the first difficulty which these companies were facing was limited manufacturing capacity because the demand was so many billions of dollar uh, doses of vaccine, their capacity was limited. So you need, you need to quickly find out uh, to, uh, to find out uh, you know, th this uh, limited manufacturing capacity, you, you need to find out uh, a larger capacity. New plants had to be set up. So the Army Corps of Engineers were used to set up these uh, uh, new manufacturing capacity. And also you found capacity abroad in Europe to, uh, to, to manufacture these uh, vaccines. Disruptions to manufacturing supply chains, because as you know, vaccine is part of a global value chain. When you make vaccine, you require so many components uh, about 400 different components or uh, inputs are required, and these are made all over the world. And supply chains were badly affected because of lockdowns. Uh, and so, uh, and the United States itself is a major producer of quite a few of these components. But there are other companies abroad; they were exporting these to other countries. So the U.S. said, uh, uh, "Use the Defense Production Act to say that uh, the, the 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 first right of these." Uh, use of these uh, inputs should be for American companies. So there was no export ban, but there was a, a, a the Defense Production Act actually specified that these uh, inputs should only go to American companies first. And after they are fully satisfied, then it can go to other companies. And that, in fact, that's one of the things which affected India uh, in terms of its uh, uh, the Serum Institute, for instance. And then the third one was gaps in availability, availability of workforce. Okay, for instance, so they found out that some key personnel which are required for manufacturing of vaccines was uh, not available in in uh, the United States. They were only available in, uh, uh, say, for instance, in Europe or in Turkey or in some other country. Uh, so the Americans spotted them, and uh, the, the the Operation Warp Speed people actually liaison with the Ministry of Immigration to make sure that these people are given a, va a vaccine and they're put on the next flight to the United, United States. I'm not uh, uh, sort of exa exaggerating, but this is precisely what has happened when I read through the government ac accountability. So what I'm trying to say is that government accountability report or the CAG report equivalent was used not to, uh, to destroy a, a research and a research capability in these companies, but rather supporting them in a very constructive kind of manner, okay? 
And so then of course, Sunil, I, you have finished 45 minutes. Yeah, yes, uh, yes. I, I will. Uh, I will take uh, a little bit more time. Okay, and and, uh, and um, then we will uh, uh, we use the defense. Uh, the second instrument that was used was basically the Defense Production Act, which I also mentioned. You know, it was uh, 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 basically used to defend the country against the virus. So that the enemy here was the virus. So they said that this act could be this act was dormant. It was only in 1950, never used again. And and they so they they started using it. And I I gave you one instance where one specific instance where how the act was actually used. And as a result, what you find is that vaccine production in the United States rose very fast. Pfizer BioNTech managed to uh, make 512 million doses of vaccine in a short period of time. Okay. And uh, then, of course, Moderna had made 186.4 million doses. Johnson and Johnson had made 27 billion doses. So that's a total amount: 512 plus 186 plus uh, 27.2. Uh, okay. Of course, the Chinese have made a little bit more than the, the Americans, but uh, uh, you can see the Americans have made a, a, a very large amount of vaccines in such a short period of time because of the intervention of the uh, government. The next instrument which they have used is when you when vaccines are used, there can be side effects, and these side effects can result in some serious uh, uh, adverse events. And see, or uh, adverse events can be in the form of a, a, a you know a permanent injury to the uh, person who is vaccinated or even death. Okay, at that point, who will give the compensation? Okay, will the vaccine manufacturers have to give the compensation, or will someone else give give it? Now, the Americans have got this legislation called the COVID-19 PrEP Act Declaration, and they said that so long as this COVID-19 PrEP Act Declaration is in place, the companies don't have to give any, uh, any indemnity. Because they don't have to give any liability. They are not liable for any of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, legal issues that may arise as a result of using the vaccines. Okay. And because in, in the US, they have an, another uh, uh, comp uh, compensatory mechanism, which is called the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, which is called the CICP. Okay, so that is already in place because that's there. And because the COVID-19 PrEP Act is in place, uh, the companies don't have to have any, you know, they were saved from the trouble of uh, uh, giving uh, uh, sort of, so, uh, so that have completely de-risked de their uh, manufacturing and r and operations. Then the last instrument which they have used uh, is basically the financial support to vaccine manufacturers. Two routes. One is the R&D funding, which I briefly talked about earlier through the OWS, et cetera, and so on. And then the advanced market commitment, which I also uh, established now. I've got the numbers here. And for R uh, for in terms of public R&D funding, you can see that United States have given the largest uh, public R&D funding across uh, any country. India has given almost zero in this list. Okay. India has not given anything. The only developing country which is there is China with eight million dollars, and United States has given about two point three two million dollars. And Germany is the only other country which has given about one point five uh, billion dollars. Okay. Now this, of course, includes also people like uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and various other kinds of uh, foundation, including the country uh, songwriter Dolly Parton. She has given one million dollars for. Uh, developing vaccines okay and this vaccine uh, this r&d funding has gone to these companies and you have the details of these companies which i mentioned here you have uh, Janssen is basically johnson and johnson moderna novak novavax and so on and even our biological e which is an indian company has managed to get some uh, uh, funding from the us through basically through the uh, through the uh, bill and Melinda Gates foundation uh, because they are jointly developing a vaccine with uh, uh, with some american uh, companies the second one was basically the advanced market commitment, and that is really huge. And you can see that they have given about 24 million billion dollars. So you have 2.23 billion dollars given in the form of R&D, and you have about 24 billion dollars given in the form of uh, advanced uh, 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 advanced market commitment. Uh, uh, you know, and so that means about 26 billion dollars were given to these companies, and all their legal issues, indemnity, etc., were taken care of. And, and so there was no excuse for these companies to uh, to manufacture this. Now, this is the kind of direct funding if you want to break up company wise. So summing up the US case, basically what I find is that first they 
uh, gave a lot of importance to basic research, and this was going on for a very long period of time. So when coronavirus came, uh, they could just tweak the basic research and uh, uh, and, and uh, come out with a new vaccine. And then the other kind of problems which uh, uh, act as a kind of a barrier to uh, vaccine making, for instance, uh, availability of funds. Uh, so you have the R&D funding, you have the advanced marketing commitment funding, and the legal issues were all taken care of. And in fact, all the legal issues regarding vaccine development and vaccine distribution was collected by the federal government, the Congress Congressional Research Office produced an extremely uh, beautiful document where all the they visited all the possible legal instruments which companies can face and what are the kind of solutions what the government can provide to to overcome those uh, problems. Okay, so you find a kind of a very very strong active role by the government using a wide variety of policy instrument, including funding of R&D, giving money directly to the uh, companies. Now let's come to Indian case. India is a leading manufacturer and exporter of vaccines. We have been having a trade, positive trade balance in vaccines in general for a very long period of time. Okay. But when it came to COVID-19 vaccine and our, if you look at the structure of vaccine production in the country, as I mentioned, 89% is in the private sector. 11% is in the public sector, consisting of two different types of entities. You have the laboratories like the, uh, the Central Research Institute in Kasaudi or the Pasteur Research Institute in Kunur or uh, the, the, uh, the uh, BCG uh, laboratory in Gindi, etc. and so on. And then, of course, you have the uh, uh, public sector, uh, the pure and simple public sector units. And also you have a, a large number of private sector units. And in fact, what is interesting is that private sector's entry into vaccine making, as I mentioned before, started in 1952. You know, in fact, the Zydus Cadilla, which has come out with a COVID-19 vaccine just yesterday, also was in existence since 1952, biologically even E is in 1953, Serum Institute in 1966, and so on. Bharat Biotech, of course, uh, came up much later in 1996. So you can see that uh, uh, the India's uh, uh, vaccine production was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dominated by the private sector for a very long period of time, and you know, and it was not due to any kind of uh, what what I may call any, you know, the there was some kind of recent writings may say say that uh, 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 the. Uh, there was a kind of a de-emphasis which was given to public sector in the production of vaccine. Yes, that may have happened in the sense that some of these laboratories and some of these units were not, al not allowed to be expanded, not allowed to have the license renewed, etc. and so on. And that may well have happened. And we can take up that uh, kind of uh, point in the discussions as well. So basically, the point that I'm trying to make is that the private sector was also very much in place uh, during this period. I'm putting it in a little bit uh, challenging way, this, uh, uh, this particular uh, fact. And you can see that out of the 8.1 uh, billion doses, almost like 7.2 billion doses is in the private sector. And public sector is only about 800 million uh, doses. And this is vaccines in general. Okay. Now, there are four characteristics of vaccine R&D in India. Okay, for much of the R&D projects on vaccine in India are devoted to the adaptation of already known vaccine technologies specifically, specifically to the Indian conditions, because you need, you need to tweak the vaccines for the Indian conditions. And now you know that we have variants which are specific to India. So you need to tweak uh, the vaccine for, so you need to do some R&D. So that's what was going on, okay? As a result of one of the main objectives of this adaptive R&D was making large doses of a particular vaccine at the lowest, lowest cost possible. And that Indian companies have managed to do it quite well. For instance, Serum Institute is considered to be one of the, uh, uh, the lowest cost manufacturer, least cost manufacturer of vaccines in the world. Okay. And India has several technologically capable exclusive vaccine manufacturers, plus many pharmaceutical companies with vaccine development capabilities. For instance, uh, Cytis Cadilla is a pharmaceutical company, but it has also got uh, vaccine uh, making capabilities. Okay. And the priorities for vaccine R&D was also set out in our national, we have a, a, a national vaccine policy for the first time in 2011, which gave a lot of importance to uh, uh, developing uh, and vaccines, which are for uh, diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea, infectious disease, capable, uh, capable of spreading epidemics such as the Japanese encephalitis, dengue, 
cholera and typhoid. Okay, so we have actually a national vaccine policy in place in 2011. I'm sorry to say that this policy was never invoked, even in popular discussions, even in the discussions in the uh, in, in, you know in current discussions. Hardly anybody is referring to this, and it only shows that it has been buried into the uh, into the vaults of the Ministry of Human Family uh, Health and Family Welfare, and not invoked. If you just take it and 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 uh, implement it, I think quite a lot of the problems can be sorted out. Now we do have a large number of uh, R and T projects which are going on in the area of uh, COVID nineteen vaccines itself, and you can see clearly three different strategies. The first strategy is uh, voluntary licensing in terms of its importance. Uh, you have uh, two firms which are uh, uh, plus a new firm which is going to come up. The two firms are Serum Institute uh, with uh, Oxford AstraZeneca and also with the Novavax of uh, uh, the US. Uh, and that Novavax vaccine is yet to be authorized. Okay, and then you have a uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories and and uh, and Panatech Bio uh, Panacea Biotech for uh, uh, with the Gamalia Research Center in the Russia for Sputnik Five uh, vaccine. So those are the two. Uh, uh, Two, two, two plus one firms which are having voluntary licensing. Okay, and then you have a, a, a own R and T, which is basically two firms: uh, Bharat Biotech with Co vaccine and Science Cadilla with the new vaccine Zycov Zy D, which was a DNA vaccine, uh, which is just uh, for which they have applied for an emergency use and authorization yesterday, and 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 uh, and so on. And uh, uh, and then of course you have uh, three firms. Uh, which are making vaccines uh, there are with four projects. Bharat Biotech uh, comes there as well with two projects. Uh, and and uh, one of the three firms is Bharat Biotech. And, they are, uh, and the other firm is uh, Bi uh, Biological E. And the third firm is a small biotech firm, which is based in, uh, uh, in Pura called Genova. Uh, uh, and all these three firms are having partnerships with American companies. Okay, so that's a kind of a, a scene for uh, uh, vac uh, vaccine development in the country. And, uh, uh, and and what are the kind of instruments which are actually used in, in, in India? First, le let's take the legislative changes with the US use. If you remember that emergency authorization, we don't have anything here or in, in, to that equivalent. We have a liberalized pricing and accelerated national COVID-19 vaccination strategy, which was announced in April 2021, but that, that is a vaccination strategy and it is not a vaccine development strategy at all. So we have, don't have any kind of a strategy. The only strategy that we have in place is the national vaccine policy of 2011, which nobody talks about. The union budget, which uh, Mr. Sidharaman has presented last February of 2021, had uh, had uh, given a figure of 35,000 crores, but we have very little knowledge about uh, what that 35,000, how that 35,000 crores is uh, going to be spent. And in fact, the Supreme Court has asked government to give uh, uh, details of that 35,000 crores. And in fact, the further affidavit which the government has submitted to the Supreme Court on 26th of June, uh, I I went through the 380 page document and uh, and uh, 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 the real substance is in seven, 71 pages only and i did not find the a breakup of the 35000 crores but i found 10000 crores which are used for uh, uh, buying vaccines from these uh, uh, from these domestic vaccine manufacturers okay buying vaccines so that's not advanced marketing commitment that is you buy the vaccine and then you give the price for them to them. Advanced marketing commitment is before the vaccine is delivered to give the money. Okay, So that is given only 1,500 crores for one company. And I will talk about that a uh, little later. Institutional support, if you talk in terms of the uh, OWS, the Operation Warp Speed, we have the equivalent of that, the NECVAC, the National Expert Group on Vaccine Administration and uh, uh, C stands for, I don't know what, uh, development or something. OK, uh, uh, so that's a uh, no, I'm sorry, the National Export Group on Vaccine Administration and uh, OK, uh, let me not try what that C stands for. OK, and and, uh, 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 and the functions of uh, NECPAC, if you go through, none of the unlike in the case of the operational watch speed, where you have a fair amount of uh, uh, 
uh, material on what we were doing, the minutes of the meetings, etc., available online. Nothing of the net network is available online. The only thing that's available online is the minutes of the very first meeting, which was in August of 2020. And from that minutes, I have managed to get the functions of network. And if you go through that, you find that there is absolutely nothing for vaccine development. There's only for uh, there is one thing called procurement mechanism for COVID-19 vaccines, but uh, and uh, uh, and uh, but there is nothing for vaccine development here at all. Of course, the closest thing that has come, we are deciding the broad parameters and guiding the selection of COVID-19 vaccine candidates for the country. Okay, but this vaccine candidates for the uh, country is based on the availability of vaccine, which have already been developed uh, 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 by the companies have developed it on their own. Okay, so it's not it's a it's a uh, uh, so on vaccine development you don't you do not have a uh, yeah okay C stands for COVID nineteen that's what so uh, uh, for, for vaccine development you don't seem to be having uh, much in the network uh, document okay but and you can also see two uh, distinct phases in the operation of the network you have the first phase from August two thousand twenty up till April two thousand twenty one. And after the Supreme Court has stepped in, you can find that uh, you you find that uh, the uh, NECVAC has uh, started uh, giving more importance to vaccine development. For instance, they came out with a a, a, a table on um, uh, the kind of vaccines which are going to be available in the country. And in fact, the original figure that they talked about was about 2.16 billion doses, which now in the for uh, the further affidavit, which they have signed, they have corrected that to 1.35 uh, billion. So the network is now very much concerned with improving the vaccine production uh, of the country. Now, the most important, much more than the network, the important uh, one which was uh, meant for uh, the institutional support was the COVID Suraksha mission. And, and and the nodal agency for uh, implementing the COVID selection mission is basically the Department of Biotechnology. And the Department of Biotechnology in its latest annual report for 2020-21, you find that about 900 crores were uh, set apart for vaccine R&D. There were about 11 vaccine candidates have been supported by the DBT. And in fact, so, and uh, and uh, and so some of the vaccine candidates which are now in human uh, trials are all supported by the, for instance, the Zykov D, which which has uh, received, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 100 crores out of this 900 uh, from the COVID Suraksha mission. Okay, so COVID Suraksha mission is the uh, one which has actually given. So uh, the total amount of money that has given for uh, R R and T is about 900 crores, uh, uh, and and how much of this is actually given to companies, I do not have any details because that's not available. Okay. Now, of course, there is this literature which has actually argued that in the institutional support, you must involve the public enterprises because they do have a fair amount of capability. They have a long history of manufacturing and research and manufacturing vaccines. As I said, this public sector enterprise entities are two components. One is enterprises, the other one is laboratories. And uh, and basically, the, the the literature was saying that those laboratories should be involved in the making uh, uh, manufacture of COVID nineteen uh, vaccines. Okay, and uh, and and a fair amount of uh, uh, and and you can see that the government has now uh, come up after the Supreme Court inter intervention. The government has now involved three. Uh, uh, the the most important point about involving the public sector is. First, you need to have a technology that you can license to them. Okay, so that means an indigenously developed technology because you can. It's not easy to get a foreign technology and you can give it to the these company. Second, these companies must be given substantial sums of money for expanding their manufacturing capability capabilities. Okay, and third, uh, which may be even first, is that their license itself needs to be renewed. Because according to the, uh, the 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 Central Drug Standard Control Organization, the Drug Standard Control Organization, the, the um, you know the license of most of these laboratories have got over in 2017-18. They need to be because they have failed to improve their manufacturing 
capable, you know, standards to current good manufacturing practices, CGMP practices. Okay, so they need to have that that pulling up the socks also need to happen. In any case, the government has now uh, 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 voluntary licensed the co-vaccine technology to three, uh, uh, you know, uh, public sector units, and uh, 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 and this is a. Uh, uh, the three public sector units are uh, Indian Immuno Immunologicals, uh, which has got its human biological institutes with them. And then you have the BB call, and then you have uh, the Hafken Institute in Mumbai, which is a state government, uh, uh, Maharashtra state government. Uh, uh, so that controversy is now taken care of with, with the uh, licensing of this technology. So how much money has government really given? I tried to piece together all this information in fact, I would say that mine is a little bit of estimate, okay? Uh, and uh, Mission COVID Suraksha R&T, 900 crores, uh, uh, the source of this information is the annual report of the, uh, to the, to the uh, Department of Biotechnology. Funds provided by ICMF, ICMF for development of co-vaccine, which is given only for clinical trials. So this is not, money is not given to Serum Institute. It is given for clinical trials of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and also, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of uh, Covaxin. Uh, and so that's 35 crores uh, of money. So it's not given to Bharat Biotech, it's only 35 crores would be given. Funds provided by ICMR for testing COVID shield in India, 11 crores. This, in, this, in, this is mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the uh, initial, uh, the first affidavit submitted by the government to the, the Union of India to the Supreme Court, okay? Then, in terms of advanced marketing commitment, in the first affidavit, I could get the 1732.50 crores plus 787 to Serum Institute and BBIL. But I'm not sure whether this is really advanced marketing commitment or if this is, uh, you know, uh, you know, is purchase price of the vaccine. As, as I told you, the two are different. Okay, and and, and uh, so if that's not, then you have to remove that quantity from there. But this 1,500 crores is advanced marketing commitment. That's given to Biological E for making a, a protein subunit vaccine called Corbivax, which is yet to be, which is going to be released during the period August through August through December period. And this is the vaccine which, which I said is being developed by Biological E joined with two American organizations. Okay. Then the government has also given some credits without a bank guarantee to. Uh, uh, to Serum Institute and Barrett Biotech. The sum of all these put together is about 9,465 crores. Okay, so nothing much. So using both the arrow argument and using uh, 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 the, the, the uh, Nelson argument, Government of India doesn't seem to have actually given any amounts to the private sector companies. And they seem to be simply shying away because uh, uh, there, there is a certain amount of discussion also in the uh, in the popular press, etc., and so on, by uh, by saying that giving money to these private sector companies is not a good thing. But actually, what you find is that that has to be given given the appropriability problem that we talked about in in, in, in the beginning. Okay, and that is actually money well spent and not. Uh, so, if you take a distribution of the government's financial support, ten percent has gone for R and D. AMC is 42%, but I have said there is some question mark regarding some of the amounts that I put. Much of it is uh, loans without a bank guarantee, about 48%. And uh, as you know, that's not a giving loans is not a way of uh, uh, is not risk financing because loans can be recalled even if the project is not successful. And, and so that's not really a. And then, of course, the government has done a very good thing, which is lobbying in the international arena with the WTO for waiving the patent for uh, COVID-19 vaccines. And as you can see, within a very short period of time, these companies have taken and applied for a, these are patent applications in the European Patent Office, uh, a large number, of, and the names of some of these companies may sound like Greek to you, but uh, don't misunderstand, misunderstand them. White is actually a subsidiary of Pfizer. So Pfizer has not applied for this vaccine uh, patents directly, but it has done it through. So a lot of these companies are, actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsidiaries of already existing companies. So patent waiver can, uh, 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 and, and you can see that the uh, Moderna has already given a patent pledge, and also the United States has already said that they will waive the patent. 
but the Euro European Union and uh, the uh, and number of other countries, including Switzerland, Japan, uh, and and so on, Japan and uh, uh, and uh, Norway, etc., have said that they will uh, uh, fight against this, and no decision has been taken ab ab about the patent waiver so far. Although there is a uh, India has received a backing of about 100 to 164. Now, some people argue that this patent waiver waiver for vaccines is a non-issue because vaccines are complex uh, molecules. And so even if these are uh, made available, uh, reverse engineering this is going to be difficult. Okay. And, uh, but that I'm not in a position to say whether that's a real good argument. I am basically referring to the argument by Matthew Kavanagh and David Dollar in a Brookings, uh, Brookings uh, 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 blog. Government stand on compulsory license. Government of India is against compulsory licenses. No, doesn't feel that compulsory licenses is meaningful. It, it's preferring uh, a voluntary licenses on the other hand, and, and it is actually pointing out to the fact that managed to get a voluntary licenses on their own. Companies have managed to get voluntary licenses on their own. Uh, uh, and there were three instances. So compulsory license, the government of India is not for it. In any case, India has used compulsory license only once uh, uh, for an anti-cancer drug. In the, the last point that I would mention is that in the insertion into the global value chain for vaccines, vaccines require a number of uh, inputs. Majority of those inputs are manufactured by different countries. The OECD has made a complete picture mapping out of those uh, inputs. And it has found that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, India is a major manufacturer of only preservatives. All the other things uh, is in other countries, so they have to be imported from other countries. And because of the uh, the Defense Production Act, United States had already put a de facto export ban on these items. China is also a major manufacturer, so they are also a major manufacturer of vaccines, so they are also not uh, sending these. So non-availability of these. Uh, and use, in fact, I have taken 16 of these uh, major inputs, which are identified by the OECD. And against the HS codes from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry website, I have from the India's uh, uh, detailed commodity uh, uh, imports uh, data, I have worked out how much of imports have, been, uh, uh, have happened. And you can see about $3 billion uh, of, uh, of, of, in, of imports of inputs. There can be some overestimation here because neomycin, which is one of the items, can be used for other drugs as well. It's not just uh, invited, uh, imported for vaccines alone. But what I'm trying to say is that what has uh, uh, government of India done in terms of uh, uh, getting to the manufacturer, getting to these private sector manufacturers in these inputs? On the other hand, government has clamped a customs duty, as has been pointed out by our own student, uh, uh, ex-student Professor Viramani and his uh, student Basu, who has published a blog in, in Ideas for India, where they have shown that in vaccines, government of India has clamped a custom duty of 9.3%. Of course, this has been uh, uh, removed for three months, but, uh, uh, but only for three months. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, Given the fact that India is not properly inserted in the global value chain for vaccine production, these inputs have to be obtained from abroad. And and uh, uh, the uh, and as uh, 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 Viramani and Basu has argued, <laughs> the customs duty also needs to be reduced. Indemnity clauses. Now, indemnity clauses. Government of India was against providing. Uh, uh, indemnity to uh, the foreign manufacturers. In fact, that was one of the conditions which Pfizer put forward uh, before they could come into India. Okay, and, uh, uh, and, and and that was not given. Okay, that is not given. But uh, then, of course, Pfizer said that if they are, that's not given, we will uh, not come into the country. Okay. So ultimately, I think the government seems to have given. That's what the press reports uh, indicate. I, I, uh, so I can be corrected on this, uh, but. Uh, uh, the press reports indicate that after some initial tethering, the government has finally informed, uh, uh, approved Pfizer's request. Now, the problem is, unlike the CICP in the case of the, uh, in, in the US, we don't have anything like that here. Okay, significant, uh, according to a question which was asked, answered in the Lok Sabha, between 2008 and 2020, uh, uh, you know, the number of people who have suffered significant uh, adverse events, injuries, and deaths due to uh, drug trials in India is 4,780 people. They have either uh, died or they have uh, been affected very badly. 
And to these people, the compensation given is also uh, very little. Okay, and 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 the compensation in some cases just uh, um, you know maximum of a few lakh rupees. And this, this is what the uh, uh, the current rules allow us. So uh, you know allowing uh, this you know uh, going back on this intermediate process, I'm not too sure, uh, but I suppose uh, uh, the government has to weigh the uh, the cost and benefit of it. So that's something which we can come. So finally, the contrast between India and uh, I'm sorry, Nagraj, I took more time. So uh, support for basic r and in the, in the US case, it's solid, long history of federal funding r and India, weak, almost non-existent. No legislative changes, emergency support in the US, 2.3 billion is made available, no strategy for vaccine development, but a system of for vaccinations only. Union budget had provided that 35,000 crores or I converted that into millions of dollars for about 472 million. Uh, uh, and we don't have any, you know, at best we have uh, spent 10,000 crores out of that 35,000 crores for buying vaccines and not giving any support uh, to the manufacturers. Institutional support, solid two institutional mechanism, the US operation, Bob speed, use of the Defense Production Act, India, not so strong, network, two different phases, before the Supreme Court intervention and after the uh, and, uh, and and post Supreme Court intervention, after Supreme Court intervention, most strong vaccine selection mission. Of course, it has funded uh, a number of vaccine pro projects, but only 900 crores have been actually set apart. How much of that has been actually spent? I really do not know. Financial support. U.S. has both funding of R and T through the uh, and also the AMC route advanced uh, advanced marketing commitment. India three routes. Funding of R&T, AMC, of course, very small amount, and the loan guarantee route, which is a, which I said, is not a very good one. IPRs in the Indian, Indian in the US case, they are willing to suspend the IPRs for a, a short period of time, and uh, individual companies have given patent pledges, uh, and in India has lobbied for patent waiver, not favoring compulsory license, and on the other hand, preferring voluntary licenses. Indemnity clauses in the US, there is nil. India, it's question mark. Whether it's there or not, I don't know. Press report says it's not there. So, and federal central government support for improving the ease of manufacturing, substantial through uh, audit reports of the government accountability report. In India, ambiguous private sector enterprises are able to fend for themselves. So you find Mr. Adar Punawala of Sudam Institute sending tweets uh, and uh, and uh, uh, sending his tweets to the Portus, which is the president of the United States for uh, lifting those uh, ex de facto export bans. I don't know whether any diplomatic channels have been used by India to do, do this. I lack information there. Overall opinion about the use of industrial policy instruments in, in, in the US, substantial in, in India, very limited and protect and is proceeded in two phases uh, before and after the intervention of the Supreme Court. After the intervention of the Supreme Court, a lot more has taken place. What are the policy outcomes? Of course, this is too early to measure that. Total vaccine production in the United States, 369 million doses. India, 279 million doses. Majority of is it is through voluntary licenses and not through own r and okay? And, uh, and of course, the other things, I don't go into those numbers because they can be a little bit uh, problematic in the sense that the number of people who are actually vaccinated because that can change. So what are the policy lessons for India? Uh, uh, first, emphasize a strong role for government in both basic and applied development research government should step in we have the national institute of biology we have the international center for genetic engineering and Bi biotechnology we have a large number of and our indian scientists are extremely good in terms of in fact i have a list of indian scientists who are making the scene in the united states either as infectious uh, disease specialists immunologists epidemiologists and so on okay which i will present in a, in a different presentation Okay, so uh, Indian scientists are actually, and in fact, my earlier research has also, also shown a dollar of r and investment in India can lead to large number of patents being created. So we need to emphasize a strong role for government in both basic and uh, applied research. Government should not be shying away from this. And uh, the policy of economic liberalization, private station should not come in the way of the government entering the area of knowledge uh, development. Involve the public sector, not only in vaccine development, but also in vaccine R&D, okay, vaccine, uh, 
the, the government has already involved them in public in uh, in public sector in vaccine manufacturing uh, uh, and and there is a large uh, vaccine manufacturing facility which is lying dormant in uh, near uh, uh, in Chingalpot near Chennai. You know all these can be uh, uh, you know uh, uh, dusted up and made ready at least in the long run. Okay, and the state must play a very active role in making available critical raw materials and inputs. It should use its auditing mechanism not for uh, uh, you know going after uh, uh, you know. Uh, you, you know, companies and people and organizations, but rather for uh, just like the government accountability, uh, government, uh, the government accountability reports in the US, uh, you know, going, going after, you know, finding out problems, constraints, and how government can actually solve them. Uh, and the US case has shown that in, invoking industrial policy instruments is extremely beneficial for promoting innovations in vaccine development and other areas of uh, high technology. And they have now replaced that with a proper act right now. Okay, so I think I, I stopped here. I'm extremely sorry that I took more time, but uh, you know, I had many things to say. Nagraj, you could take over. Uh, thank you, Sunil. I know, I know uh, you had a long presentation. I know you have done enormous work and you know, uh, you've been quite involved in this. So I can understand your, your passion for sharing all the details with the, with the audience i can appreciate that okay now uh now the floor is open for questions we still can take a couple of questions uh now uh, uh, may i invite questions uh, from uh from the audience anybody uh can uh, raise their hand or write it in the in the chat box uh, i'll uh, can uh, either uh, raise the hand or uh, yes uh mishraji please uh, yes uh, First, Ms. Raji, then, uh, uh, then uh, Dr. Patak uh, Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, Dr. Mishra, first. Uh, uh, Ms. Raji, please uh, unmute. Unmute, unmute. Uh, thank you, Professor Nagaraj. It was a fascinating presentation, and as you rightly uh, put it, uh, very well prepared, but two things are there. You know, uh, Professor Mani was talking about, you know, one year's time, I think, you know, that was a fantastic thing that he pointed out. We can do that in India. We can do that in India because uh, in each state, you know, we had set up what, you know, is known as uh, state uh, uh, drugs and pharmaceutical corporations. So can we revive them? Can we revive IDPL? You know, a great enterprise. So that's one. Number two, we have talked about the role of the central government. But do you think state governments can do? Because everything I think I don't expect central government, you know, the way person money has pointed out the you know, very lackadaisical uh, uh, kind of role central government has played. So I don't think we can, you know, we can push them. But then can we get something, you know, better through the state governments? I think there are some state governments which might, uh, as a person, uh, Mani was saying about Hopkins Institute. So, can we get uh, something more out of uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the state government institute? And the third thing is, can banks like you know green finance, climate finance, sustainable finance? They have been talking. Can they come out with some scheme? Can banks? Can these DFIs? Can these banks? Can they come out? I think on that. Why should we leave? I think to a government which has not been believing. I think it has not been believing. Should we allow people to die? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. I think now, uh, Dr. Pater Pong, uh, sorry if I got my name wrong. Yeah, could you please ask a question? Then we will ask uh, Sunil Rimba. Yes, uh, Dr. Oh. Uh, okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sunil. It's very impressive uh, presentation as always. Uh, uh, I was, uh, from your presentation, it looked like India is more like a free market economy and US is much more state intervention. This is uh, opposite to conventional wisdom. And US try to use all the industrial policy, uh, uh, subsidizing not only basic research, but also apply and development and uh, manufacturing of the vaccine, and even uh, prohibiting uh, export of components 
for the vaccine for other country and even use the public procurement uh, to buy the US made vaccine even before it has been uh, delivered to the market. So it used all the industrial policy, all of this against what US has pledged for the free market economy and try to stop other countries to use this kind of measure. So, uh, but uh, what they have done, maybe it's not so uh, obvious for other countries. Your, your research is something like you dig very deep and you can publicize it. For what they have done is best, what is very different from what they preach and, and look like in case of India is more, much more free market. And even with, with limited government subsidy, uh, limited government intervention, India has done very well as a, one of the top three largest producers of the vaccine yeah, after US and China. That's uh, amazing. I think even we, without even more intervention from the government, India will be done, we will be do uh, much, even much better than what they are doing now. So that is amazing story. So I just want to say something like this. I just want to congratulate you for very substantial research. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah. I'll pick up one more question, then you can answer them. There is uh, one, uh, Vijay Shankar, can you? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Vijay Shankar, would you please, uh, uh, can you come in? Yeah, I have uh, not one but three uh, questions. No, but quickly, but I... quickly, please, quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah. First question is that uh, the comparison that you made is between India and the US is the clarification is why not China? <clears throat> why was China not looked at? That's the first question. Uh, second one is the thing that uh, you talk about um, the hesitation to finance and what we, the overall message that comes out is the government's overall in hesitation to finance uh, the production of vaccines. Is that is that related to the government's capacity or low capacity, especially in the North Indian state where I'm sitting, uh, to deliver uh, vaccinations? So vaccines produce karke karna ki unless you uh, use it for vaccinations. The government has low capacity to vaccinate. Is that the reason why the production is low? That's my second question. And third one is a much larger issue that what you're uh, pointing to is the government's uh, hesitation to finance health, which I think is not now if you look at India's 70 uh, uh, decades of history, it, um, uh, the uh, investment that we just called India is the lowest kind of uh, largest uh, out of pocket health expenditure in the world and very yeah. low proportion of public expenditure. It may be related to that. Is it related to that? Is my question. And I had one small clarification also the slide that you showed, some of the tables were not very visible. Uh, what, is the, 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 what is the comparison of US and India in terms of vaccines produced, number of vaccines produced, and uh, in terms of population covered? I think uh, the difference is not as significant as I think you, you would come out from the, uh, as it, it might seem, from the support given. You mentioned something 329 in China and, uh, sorry, in the US and some 200 something in India. So India has not done so badly as the, the speaker before me mentioned. In, despite lack of support, etc., India has not done badly in terms of vaccine production. By whatever means, maybe by importing technology, maybe by collaborations, by vaccine production has happened. So I think the difference is not that significant. And the number of people covered was not very visible. And I would imagine that population covered in India will be much higher than that in US. For the simple reason that India is a much more highly, and that figure was not visible, I can't see. Yeah. Okay. Those Thank, are you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Vijo. Uh, so, uh, so you can be my answer these questions. I'll try to pick up other set of questions. Please continue. I, I'll first start with uh, Ms. Raji's question. Ms. Raji, I uh, always uh, respect him as my guru. And uh, uh, and um, he has raised this point about uh, involving public sector uh, uh, pharmaceutical public sector enterprises like IDPL, for instance, in vaccine production. In fact, that is uh, uh, that's an argument in the long run, not in the short run, because you have you need substantial revamping of those manufacturing facility. In fact, uh, even before going into those uh, um, you know defunct public sector units, you all already have this huge integrated vaccine complex, which I mentioned near Chennai, which has been set up in 2012 and has not uh, re resulted in a single dose of vaccine being produced from that huge facility. Okay, so that could be, uh, for instance, uh, uh, quickly you know um, you know completed, and and then you can start doing that. Okay, so that's the answer, a short answer to your uh, first question. The second one is about state government. Can we involve state governments? Now, even in the United States, the among the 50 states, the only state which is involved in vaccine making is California. 
no other states in the country is uh, making vaccine because health, uh, you know, this it's, it's there are economies of scale and it is important that this has to be done at the central government level. OK, so it's best it is done at the central government. The Hafken Institute has remained in a dormant fashion for such a long period of time. That's why it has to be revived uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, support, etc. In, in the in the short period of time. OK, so that I think is uh, the answer to the. Yeah. So although some state governments, including that of Kerala, for instance, is trying to, uh, uh, you know, to to. But for that, you need a technology, you know, before you start, um, you know, either you must have your own technology or you should be in a position to have technology from some public laboratory voluntary license to these Indian uh, uh, state government companies. So uh, uh, R&D is the first thing and that has to be done, you know. It's not important whether it should be done by the state or central, but somebody should do it. Here, nobody's doing it in a systematic way. Okay. And I will take up the Vijay Shankaran's point about because I think merely by looking at the amount of vaccines produced uh, should not be taken to show that uh, because the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, vaccines are fully covered with patents, patent waiver is only for a short period of time. And if you do not have, and you really do not know the kind of uh, uh, in, uh, restrictive clauses which are inserted into the voluntary licensing agreements, okay? Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the AstraZeneca would have in, inserted many uh, uh, restrictive clauses into Serum Institute, which they, of course, they will not be able to talk about it openly at all. And same case with the Gamaria Research Center with uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's laboratories and so on. So by simply making uh, uh, with someone else's technology and then having that as a total number, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not for it, you know, because here is a country which has got a long history of vaccine uh, development and uh, and technology. Why can't it do this? Okay, a small biotech company based in Pune, Genova, uh, uh, Genova Biotech has been able to come out with uh, with uh, as a concept they have come out with an mrna vaccine which doesn't use cold chain management the main problem with mrna vaccine the pfizer biotech vaccine is this elaborate cold chain you remember that they require about minus 70 degrees whereas the other vaccines do two plus two degrees centigrade to eight degrees centigrade okay yeah. and, and you so you cannot store the vaccine without having an elaborate cold chain which we don't have okay so what uh, Genova has developed is basically that. So you have a number of uh, uh, small, small companies like that, which could have actually developed, which never done. So I've just quickly answered Vijay Shankaran's one point. I will answer his other points also. Now, Padarapong, basically, I think completely agree with uh, 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 India seems to be becoming more like a free market economy. And whereas the United States is uh, using every industrial policy instrument available in the book to support their knowledge production. But I must say that even while, and, and they were very clever in telling others that you please leave everything to the market <coughs> and, 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 uh, and market will be very efficient and everyone uh, you know, will be able to. And you can see that uh, uh, even American uh, uh, advisors, bureaucrats, for instance, Ben Bernanke has written the best paper. You know, you, you know who Ben Bernanke was. He's the federal, uh, you know, uh, the, the federal support chief. He has written the best paper, which I always ask students to read. How how government should be? Why government should be supporting R and D? That's the title of his paper. Okay, so government intervention in R and D development has always been a, a accepted thing in the in although they went around telling others, uh, uh, as you have correctly said, that thou shalt not reinvent the wheel. You simply, um, you know, import technology from abroad. And, mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, and then research done by uh, uh, American researchers themselves have shown. I'm referring to the uh, uh, the book by Ma uh, uh, Ashish Arora, Alfonso Gambadella and Forcefully, uh, called titled Market for Technology, published by MIT Press. We have that in our library here as well and uh, shows that uh, the market for disembodied technology has been becoming imperfect over a period of time. And much of the technology transactions are taking place within the multinational parent firm and its affiliate abroad. Intra-firm transfers, not inter-firm transfers. So this, uh, 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 
you know, uh, again, uh, to be just Shankaran, you know, I, I'm provoking him, you know, this voluntary licensing, you got the voluntary licensing now because AstraZeneca wants to make large amounts of vaccines. They can't, they don't have the manufacturing capability, so they have come to here. Okay, mm -hmm. so they will not give this voluntary license always. Uh, the Russians also the same thing, I, you know, Russians, be. you know, and, and so it's a uh, 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 voluntary licensing route should I not would. be taken as a, a kind of a thing. Now, Vijay Shankar's other points, why not China? Yes, China is a good example of a, a country. I could have taken China, but where is the information? Where do I get information on uh, instruments of uh, support? I don't have mm. any information on instruments of support or uh, they are using industrial policy instruments. We all know that uh, Chinese companies are supported very heavily by the Chinese state, but you don't get any information. We don't mm. even know that Huawei is, uh, it, it's, uh, is, is a public sector company or a private sector company. So mm. you uh, easy to say, take China. It is a good example because it is the largest vaccine manufacturer in my table. But the instruments which China has used for supporting vaccines, we really do not have. Okay, mm -hmm. so I can't okay. use that for uh, a kind of a paper. Now, okay. then your uh, second point about hesitancy about finance, I completely agree. Uh, you know, no, you are saying uh, uh, vaccine production is low, low capacity to vaccinate. No. Capacity to vaccinate, yeah, no. vaccination uh, capacity. Yes, va no, that I don't agree. We have a universal immunization program in the largest universal immunization program in the world. But what is the coverage? Co coverage of children is very uh, low even now in the North Indian state. Yeah, but 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 mm. still we have we have an elaborate network. Okay, mm. we have an elaborate network which could be actually uh, uh, used. Okay, and of course there are uh, you know so I think low capacity to vaccinate should not be used as an excuse for not making vaccines here. Because, uh, um, um, you know, unless you have your own, and that your next point was about financing health. Yes, generally, it's been weak in India, and it continues to be, yes, I agree. Uh, and, uh, and there is a great reluctance on the part of government to part with money to private sector for uh, R&D, et cetera, okay? But okay. they are willing to give money for various other kinds of concessions. We know the, uh, the various other kinds of R&D concessions, which are, mm. uh, sorry, uh, corporate income tax concessions which uh, private sector companies get but not for knowledge production okay mm. so that's yeah. that's the basically and even the generosity of the rnt tax incentive was progressively reduced mm. yeah. it's very quantitative the approach in terms of rnt versus other private sector in general or yeah. corporates in general yeah yeah, yeah. thank you sunil uh, yeah. can i can we take the next round of questions we, uh, there are a couple of questions here then yeah. by when well, there's a question from Shik shikhar kumar uh my question is that broadly according to you what are the policy recommendations that india can took india can take and in which terms and why we are lacking that's one question from shikhar kumar and uh, uh hello sir i am hello sir my name is shikhar kumar and uh, i have another question is that uh since the vaccination coverage has been talking about and shankar has, sir has uh, said that uh, uh, with the coverage of our uh, coverage of vaccinations in India has been uh, quite limited. Even that uh, for the polio vaccines, we have uh, even uh, we are take, we are uh, doing vaccination for polio since a long period of time, and even now uh, only after like twenty or thirty years uh, we have uh, become polio, polio free, and even we are still in risk uh, for that. And uh, so, uh, how the vaccination process for the how basically how the demand for vaccination. Is in India is being termed. But no, I see. Unless your question is uh, unless your question is short and pointed, I won't be able to answer. So yeah, this, uh, to, sir, I am, I am asking. Try to make uh, short yes. uh, presentations yourself. Uh, you know, and if you can ask me pointed question, your first question I will answer, uh, which is uh, what are the policy lessons? So I, I mentioned that uh, uh, at the end of my presentation. First is support basic research in India. Okay. And also support applied development research because even the Americans are now going into the and have public private partnerships in uh, applied development research. Okay, support it thoroughly using instruments like research grants because grant is the only way in which a, 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 a late industrializing country can use. Okay, tax incentives are to be given to countries which are at the higher level of uh, uh, development. So give. Uh, uh, research grants 
uh, uh, to develop, especially in the area of health te technologies, including vaccines. That's the first thing. Okay. Second is uh, uh, the, the government should also remove all kinds of uh, uh, impediments, which are, you know, you talk about ease of doing business. What about all those inputs which are required for uh, making vaccines, which are not produced in India, which you have to import from abroad? Okay. You have to procure that on a war footing basis. That's what the Americans have done. Okay. So why are you not using any of your emergency measures? Okay. I mean, don't we have a Defense Protection Act equivalent here as well? Yeah. To have give preference to, uh, because this is the, the, the enemy here is the virus. It's killing people, you know, and uh, just like in the war and it's destroying the economy. So you have to take it just like a war. That's what Americans have done. So I think uh, if you do these two, I, uh, you know, I don't want to give a, and then of course you, you have a lot of other things which are there in my paper and uh, I can talk about it uh, later. Uh, Sunil, there are a couple of more questions. I think Dr. Kannan wanted to uh, ask the question. Kannan, yes, are yes. there? Yes, please. Yes, I'm there, uh, um, uh, Nagraj. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the time. Uh, Dr. Sunil Mani, I have two questions <laughs> that are unrelated. One is while we discuss about the vaccine production, the, uh, the speed with which Americans have come out. How is that the Russians came out with a, with a vaccine ahead of any other country? That's one question. Are, are there any lessons to learn from them? The second question is, uh, Sunil, as you said, a number of new vaccines are going to come into the market in India. Given the policy of the government, 75% they are going to buy for free distribution. It's a monopsonistic market in terms of buying power. So how is the price going to be uh, determined for this uh, a number of vaccines? Thank you. Uh, Sunil, uh, there's one more question. Uh, yeah. I think I'll, I'll, I'll read the question and then you can answer the, both the questions together. This is from Tyagaraj and Jayaraman. A uh, question is, what has been the role of Japan, South Korea and EU? They seem to have been missing in the action. Is it lack of capacity for innovation in the sector itself or not being able to move rapidly in time? Uh, this is a question from uh, Mr. Tyagarajan. Okay. You can take both the questions together, please. Yeah, uh, Sunil, this is yeah. Jairaman. Yeah, yeah. My full name is sometimes unrecognizable to people. <laughs> okay. No, 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 I, I, could, I could spot you. I could spot I, you. I just if uh, the chair will allow me, I, I quickly think shortly, I just uh, want to make uh, just uh, one sentence comment. Uh, uh, Dr. Nagaraj, can I? Yes, yes please, quickly. Sure. Uh, uh, see, I, I think uh, what uh, for me a big takeaway from uh, your lecture is that we were so diverted by the antics of Trump in terms of the public health aspect of it and uh, his uh, denial, et cetera, et cetera, and his whole attitude. But nevertheless, we miss the uh, underlying structural strength of the American system. And uh, you have uh, uh, illustrated, in fact, I think in late 2020, there are many Indians who perhaps felt self-congratulatory in relation to uh, even the U.S., but which was thoroughly misplaced. So I think uh, it's also for the way we comment and think about these issues. I think your uh, laying out of what uh, the U.S. did, I think is a very salutary lesson for how we should follow these issues. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Kanan, for your comments. Um, uh, we had already talked about this earlier as well. Uh, Kanan was asking why, uh, you know, what about the Russians? They have uh, the first to come out with the Sputnik V vaccines. But Kanan, how many uh, uh, Sputnik V vaccines are used inside uh, Russia? Hardly anything. In, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Putin was coming on the, uh, uh, you know, television the other day uh, because uh, the, the Russians don't trust that vaccine at all. They have come out with that vaccine very quickly, but there is a great hesitancy on the part of the Russian 
uh, uh, to to trust that the efficacy of that vaccine. That's point number one. Point number two is that uh, the the Russians also actually you know have uh, please remember that Russia is from the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union had a elaborate uh, uh, you know scientific establishment you know uh, with emphasis on basic research. So they were also giving, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing on basic research. That's why the Gamalia Research Center was able to come out with at least a vaccine quite quickly. So the same point about basic research support is also there. But they lacked companies which can make that vaccine on a substantial scale. And that's why they are actually coming now to India to make that vaccine on a, a, sub, a substantial scale. Now, your second point about new vaccines and the pricing, I'd, I have not looked at the pricing aspect at all, because as I said, my paper is looking at the R&D and manufacturing of vaccines. The complementary aspect of that is uh, the, the, the pricing and distribution of vaccines. I have not looked at that point at all, so I, I won't be able to answer that question about uh, the about the pricing, the, uh, that 75% purchased by the government and, and the remaining by the private sector and, and, the, and the pricing. See, the, one of the reasons as to why the only thing that I would say is that uh, uh, is that the government should have procured the hundred percent of of the vaccines. That's why the advanced marketing commitment should have been used. Hundred percent of the uh, vaccine should have been purchased by the government and distributed freely to every citizen. This is what the Americans have done. They have bought all the vaccines and then uh, uh, distributing it freely to. Uh, uh, at least that's my understanding. So uh, my answer to that would be uh, the uh, you know the pricing as far as the individual consumer is concerned should not be there at all, and it should be uh, you know uh, uh, completely bought by the government and 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 and, uh, and, and distributed to the uh, to the the population. So Kanan, did I answer your points? Thank you, thank you, Sunil. Okay. The next is about the uh, uh, Jeraman's point about the role of Japan, South Korea, and and EU. Yes, uh, I, I I think uh, uh, they have, uh, uh, especially the EU has a number of companies which are actually very good, and especially in Germany, Germany has a number of companies, but EU as a whole doesn't seem to have had because it has seemed to have left these things to the individual governments, and uh, and. Japan and South Korea, I'm surprised. It's a puzzle to me as to why these two countries have not come up. Of course, you have seen in my table, after India, the next next important country is uh, then Russia and then Japan, uh, and, and South Korea. Okay, but South Korea is only, when India is making two, 279 million doses, South Korea is making something like 39 something uh, uh, doses. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, puzzle to me as to why they have hesitated and why their companies have not come forward in making uh, in man in doing r and and manufacturing uh, vaccines. I, I, I wonder whether they have moved away a lot from uh, uh, science-based industries to uh, uh, to uh, to technology-oriented industries like electronics and automobiles. You know, I, I wonder whether it's something to do with that, or um, uh, or of course in therapeutics. Japan has a number of companies which are very good in therapeutics. They have very good companies in medical devices, but vaccines also they have a Takeda and other uh, those sort of companies are all are there. But uh, I, I it's it's a it's a puzzle to me as to why uh, uh, they have uh, they have um, you know they have not maybe Professor Padarapong if he's still around I think he's gone uh, he may have been able to answer that. Uh, uh, Sunil, just uh, yes. the point that uh, I was interested uh, in your comment on whether uh, they also had uh, some inability to move rapidly, to grasp the problem, as you said, you know, using yeah. something like the Defense Production Act to yeah. see it as yeah. a war-like situation, which yeah. the Americans seem to have done very successfully. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I need to, I, I, I don't have a clear answer to you for that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I, any, any, any more questions from any in the audience? Or uh, can we close this session? Any more questions? Uh, or Dr. Uh, the, uh, 
poor uh, Japanese scholar who was here. Can he answer? Can he give? Uh, would, you like, would you like to intervene? Uh, uh, Sunil, what's his name? Uh, Dr. P. Uh, Professor Patar Pong. Patar Pong. Uh, if he's around, sorry, my apologies for not getting the now name right. So, if he's sorry, around, my name is very difficult. No, for, no, so my apologies. My apologies for. Yeah, no, uh, if you sorry, would, sorry. if you like to, uh, if you like to add something to the question which uh, the earlier speaker asked about Japan and Korea, uh, uh, why they have not been able to? Would you like to uh, add something to it? Actually, as Sunil said, Japan has a big uh, pharmaceutical companies, but their specialization is not in the vaccine. Their specialization is in uh, therapeutic uh, medicine. So uh, vaccine, no, they always import uh, from abroad. So that, that, that is the, their limitation. So it's not their specialization. Uh, you can see that uh, Japan now uh, import uh, vaccine from Pfizer, from Moderna, and also from AZ, AstraZeneca as well. But they don't have a large program to finance development of the local vaccine because it's not their specialization. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh, can I so can I just uh, make a small comment? May yes. Man, who is this? Sushil. Sushil. Ah, Sushil. Yes, Sushil. Yes. Come, uh, Sushil. Speak. Sushil. Um, um, in uh, presentation, um, Sunil doesn't distinguish between public and private sector. He's looking at Indian firm. This is, you know, this thing. The public sector's capacity, the destruction of it, actually, the private sector lobbies had a great role also to play. I mean, this is well recorded by several studies and write-ups. Eh? Uh, undermining Afghan Institute. Uh, undermining other, uh, you know, drug management capacity, and the fact that this facility near Chennai is not being used despite the trainings and the chief minister uh, of Tamil Nadu, new chief minister, asking that be handed over to him, is the Italian ideological thing that that the public sector should not be uh, supported or this thing. So, yeah, yeah, I think uh, one has to make it very clear that. In India, the private sector can capture the regulators, the policy makers, and sometimes undo the rivals. This happened with airlines. This happened with the BSNL, which had the largest, uh, which had the largest uh, uh, share in the mobile market at one point of time. And so this story repeats itself. Uh, yeah, in yeah. Several forms. yeah. Sushila, do you have a, a reference for that? Um, uh, a reference uh, because what I've seen is only newspaper articles. Uh, the destruction of public sector capability by private sector through. I have only those newspaper articles. I don't have much more right now, but I'm sure there is uh, yeah, some. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Uh, Sushil, I was wondering, in fact, you know, when this whole debate was, uh, was, uh, was arising, I, I, I was thinking that a person like you with the deep knowledge of public sector would be able to intervene and write a good paper how public sector in vaccine manufacturing has been destroyed uh, as per uh, many views. I thought it should, it's, it's, time, it's time people like you should write about it. Okay, this is my view. I think if there are no more, no more questions, I think I will, I will, we can close the session. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. I think we had an excellent presentation and very, very, uh, very useful, very lively discussion. Thank you all. Uh, I think we can, we, we can uh, close the session. So Sunil, would you like to add something or? Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to thank everyone, especially the guests who have come from abroad, uh, Professor Padarapong, Professor Wu, and uh, all, all the rest. You know, uh, and uh, because I think, uh, uh, and I have a, a longish paper which uh, will be published in the current issues in India's Economy and Society series of CDS. So it should be out fairly soon, you know, because its requirement is basically a seminar which I have just given you know and, and uh, so it will be published under that series and because during COVID-19 you have a number of preprint series coming in various so this is a preprint series equivalent of CDS where we write on current issues and have them published under the current issues in India's economy and society series so it will be available on our CDS website cds.edu and you could download them okay Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, I think I'll close the session now. Uh, goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padarapong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jihing.